Welcome back to the March and Art Show, the tech show about hacking. In this video, I'm going to break down and narrate a true story uh, in which the FBI took down one of the biggest masterminds on the dark web the world has ever seen. So it's shocking. It's interesting. I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's get right into it. In 2011, the FBI became aware of an online black market website, Silk Road, where users could buy and sell goods, including illegal drugs and weapons, even murders for hire were discussed. The site was run by an individual known only as the Dread Pirate Roberts, named after a character from the classic film, The Princess Bride. An elite FBI cyber task force worked uh, to infiltrate the site and identify its founder, Ross Albright, uh, which is a 29 year old computer science engineer. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Mr. Albright. Silk Road, assessed anonymously by users on the dark web, brought in approximately $1 billion in sales, according to investigators, with Albright making millions by taking a, a cut of each transaction. <laughs> Silk Road was the Amazon of drug sites, says former FBI special agent Milan Patel, who was one of the characters here, right? Uh, the investigation led FBI agents from Iceland to New York to San Francisco in search of the shadowy figure behind the website. So uh, this is like uh, recaps of FBI agents, right, that I'm going to be narrating. They, traffic, they trafficked in anything you could get in the black market, poison, things like that, says Vincent DeCostino, who's a character. Uh, an FBI agent with the Cyber Division. Silk Road took drug trafficking into the 21st century, says DeCostino. This was so easily accessible that it ended up getting into the hands of people that never really would have touched it. That, DeCostino says, led to an overdoses and deaths. So here's the hunt for the Dread Pirate Roberts. In 2011, there was a new bad guy in the cyberspace behind the website Silk Road. He oversaw more than 200 million in illegal transactions on the dark web involving the sale of drugs, weapons, and illicit services such as computer hacking. Even murders for hire were discussed again on the website. This is a very dark website. So let's get into the characters. We have Austin Burglis who says bad guys will always find a way to use technology for malicious purposes. It's just the way it is. This Austin Burglis and this is a conversation between, uh, you know, the FBI agents, the other characters. Okay. Austin Burglis, right? I was, he was the assistant special agent in charge of the cyber branch in the FBI's New York office. When FBI agents got on the case, they only knew the site was run by someone using the alias Dread Pirate Roberts, which was a famous movie character, as we talked about earlier. So let's go into Milan Patel, who's the former special agent for the FBI NY Cyber Branch. She said, I think he had a fascination with the cult classic, The Princess Bride, like many of us who grew up in the 80s love that movie. So in The Princess Bride, it says, I inherited the ship from the previous Dread Pirate Roberts, just as you will inherit it from me. Milan Patel says, and it was a good way to sort of signal that you would never know who he is. So that's Milan Patel, Vincent uh, DeCostino, who's also a former special agent of the FBI NY Cyber Branch. As a method to throw off law enforcement, you had that smokescreen of saying, hey, Dread Pirate Roberts, maybe one person, maybe 10. So that's the origin behind it. It would take multiple law enforcement agencies more than two years of following dead ends and false leads to unmask Dread Pirate Roberts as 29 year old Ross Albright. Here's Julie, Julia V. Uh, she's not a special agent. So she said, Ross and I actually met at an African drumming class and we first, and when we first met, I was totally not into him. I just didn't really see him for him. And then once I started talking to him more, that's when I started really liking him. So Julia V and Ross, they had like some kind of a uh, romantic relationship. So uh, here's Julia V speaking. She says in 2008, uh, she met Ross at Penn State and began dating. She was a freshman. He was a grad student in material science and engineering. Julie v, Julia V says, when Ross and I started to get to know each other, it was intense. We were always hanging out. We were always doing amazing things together. So they had they had some kind of uh, thing going on. In the summer of 2009, after getting his master's degree, Ross moved home to Austin. Julia soon joined him. Both were trying to launch their careers. Julia opened a photography studio. Ross followed an unconventional path, creating a free market website where users, users could avoid government scrutiny. 
uh, the project consumed him. So here's Julia V talking. She says, a lot of times I was, I was just angry at him because I just wanted to go out. I wanted to have fun. And he was like, Julia, that's a waste of time. Julia says Ross told her he needed product to sell on his new website in early 2011 with a stash of homegrown hallucinogenic mushrooms. He launched Silk Road. Julia V says here he had this website. He had just designed everything. He figured out the system. He was excited. And then boom, no customers. And then he came up with the idea of posting to these forums like, hey, this is a really cool website. So I guess he was trying to, in, you know, get people on board uh, through that unconventional method, right? So here's Vis Vincent DeCostino, who was the FBI agent. He says he understood that in order to make the site successful, you can't simply couldn't just, you know, hang a shingle in the dark web and hope people are going to find it because that's not how the dark web operates. The postings worked. Soon, Silk Road attracted buyers and sellers from around the world to his illegal drug marketplace. So here's Jared de Yigiahan. Peter, please put his last name on the screen. Sorry to botch your name, sir. He was also a formal special agent, Homeland Security Investigations. He says on the main page, it would give you all the different items that sort of pop up that were featured items in the summer of 2011 homeland security agent jared de yigia han i'm just going to call him jared moving forward learned about packages containing small quantities of illegal drugs coming through the international mail hub at chicago's o'hare airport jared from says these are the seizures that we got on at the O'Hare that were attributed to silk road jared also adds there were address with printed labels on them so it looked like it was more of a business it definitely stuck out because you'd find five or six of the same packages all addressed to different people going all across the united states vincent de costino says so as the government started to intercept these packages it started to make people ask the question what is going on that suddenly people are starting to mail drugs Packages containing small quantities of illegal drugs coming through the International Mail Hub at Chicago's O'Hare Airport were attributed to Silk Road. So now we get into the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Jared says they started getting a little more brazen. We went from seeing maybe you know two or three packages a day to 30 packages a day to 50 packages a day within a few weeks it was hundreds of packages a day jared also says you'd <laughs> you'd see some unique things there were cd cases dvd cases just people that would put the actual pill taped to a piece of paper but then other people got a little more created so creative so you'd see things like cardboard and like even the little ripples of the cardboard they would stuff the drugs in those ripples do you see how creative people were determined to find the source of the drugs the agent showed up at a residence where one of the packages was headed to conduct a knock and talk just like it says knock and talk jared says the terms basically use essential for what it is it's literally we're knocking on the door and we just want to talk to the person. The recipient of the package wasn't home, but his roommate was willing to answer the agent's questions. I guess this is where things are getting a little spicy for us. So Jared said, you know, I'm curious, your roommate, does he get any international mail, any packages, anything unusual? And he looks at me. This is Jared speaking. He says, and he says, yeah, he's getting drugs. And he says, it's coming from this website called the Silk Road. And, you know, I ask him, well, what's the website domain? Is it silkroad.com? Is it silkroad.org? He goes, no onion. Now, here's Austin Burgless, who's a former assistant special agent in charge of the FBI NY Cyber Branch. He says the onion router or tour, uh, the onion meeting is that there's multiple layers to get to the center. And that's the way that the, you know, the tour works. There are multiple computers that one has to go through in order to reach that content, the center of the onion. So Vincent DeCostino says the tour network was created for the purpose of allowing people to communicate on the Internet without anyone having the ability to know who and where they were. So Jared says, then I said, okay, well, tell me about the way that they're, you know, paying for these things. And he says, well, they're paying with, with Bitcoin. Now, 
Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, as we, as, as we all know. Jared says these websites do not accept PayPal or Visa or MasterCard or any other types of credit cards because all that's traceable. Jared says he didn't know what he was dealing with, but incredibly, a Google search helped clear things up when he found an article on the website Gawker. So now we're going to go into Milan Patel, who says in, the June, in June of 2011, Gawker wrote this long article on Silk Road and did a great job explaining what it was, what people were doing, what they were buying, and how easy it is to buy drugs and other paraphernalia. Here's Vincent DeCostino who says, the uptick in traffic was enormous. I mean, you have to remember, people are reading this going, this is, this sounds incredible. Incredible, sorry. You know, let me try to log on to this thing and see if it actually works. But the publicity came with a downside. Silk Road was now on law enforcement's radar, courtesy of your friend, Ross. Politicians, de he's such a snitch. <laughs> Politicians demanded the site be shut down. In Chicago, Jared stepped up his investigation, seizing an ever-growing number of packages and matching them to specific vendors from around the world. Jared, you know, goes and he says, and as we're doing that, we're also taking our fingerprints that are coming off the packages. We're running through our international databases and law enforcement databases. We're sharing it with our international partners, but, but, but that doesn't take us any closer to really identifying who's running Silk Road. By the end of 2000. I mean, by the by the fall of 2011, Jared convinced the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago to take on the case. But even with his I hidden identity, Ross was starting to get nervous. Yeah, and you have your friend to think about that, Ross, your roommate. Here's Julia V who says he was scared. He was really scared. He was like, I'm going to go to jail forever for this. So now it progresses to the fbi coming on board right and here's milan patal who says you still didn't know who was behind the website you didn't know where the website was and you didn't know who was visiting the website by the end of 2011 silk road was processing orders worth half a million dollars a month selling drugs and other illicit goods and services some drugs buyers and sellers were arrested as law enforcement redoubled their efforts to figure out the identity of the site's mastermind which was the dread pirate roberts so let's so vincent uh, de costino says those traditional techniques that an investigator would use were useless in an online drug market they didn't work on the Silk Road website, people from around the world could buy and sell illicit drugs, weapons, poisons, and services such as computer hacking. In the Silk Road forums, users could even uh, discuss murders for hire. U.S. District Court uh, for the Southern District of uh, New York. Now they're involved. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of people involved. Looking for a new perspective, prosecutors asked the New York FBI cyber branch to join the hunt. This was an elite team with experience working inside the dark web and with Tor, also known as the Onion Router, where Silk Road was hidden. So now Milan Patel, uh, we're in New York City where all the big banks are. That's a lot of cyber crime happening. It's our jurisdiction. And so we had built this reputation of working these global cases and bringing them to successful prosecution. And New York, New York is, you know, considered the business capital of America and the world. But to get involved, the FBI team needed to prove to their bosses these, this case was about a lot more than drugs. Austin Burglis. Uh, we had to show that Silk Road was offering hacking services, cybercrime services on the site in order to devote the resources. And Milan Patal uh, comes in here. She says, we saw murder for hire postings, which is incredibly serious. Hacking for hire postings, which was, hey, pay me two Bitcoin and I'll hack into your ex-wife or ex-husband's email account. That's kind of weird and i suspect people were using it because it made a lot of sense it was totally anonymous and you could never trace it back to the person who asked for it in september 2012 the new york cyber branch opened a case under the same name which was operation onion peeler the mission find the silk road server jared jared comes back in he says there's a computer somewhere that act <laughs> that actual website's running off of and when the internet internet's trying to read um to direct traffic to the website it has to know where to go and what does tor uh does is it protects the information it protects the ip addresses right a service ip address is like a telephone number normally once agents find a potential ip address they get a subpoena from a judge 
to request further information from the internet service provider, but Tor protects its users by constantly changing that information. You see how <laughs> they be trying to be one step ahead of the game? Now, Austin Burglis, he says, by the time we got the request back from the internet service provider, the pathway to that content had changed. We were always too late. Milan Patal comes in, she says, always one step behind, sometimes by minutes, just close enough. It's painful because you want to get lucky at least once, and you wasn't getting lucky. Agents speculated about who was the Dread Pirate Roberts, also known as DPR. Milan Patal comes in, she says, my initial guess was he was probably a normal kid that did something that he thought was really cool, and then it spiraled into something huge. We had arrested folks in the past that were global phenomenons on the internet. And when you arrest them, you find out they're totally normal people. I mean, they've got day jobs. They've got families. Milan Patal also says DPR had a real life. I'm sure he had friends that had no idea that he was probably one of the biggest masterminds on the internet. At the time, one of the only people who knew the real identity of DPR was Julia V, which was, you know, his girl. Uh, after several years of dating, she and Ross has ended their relationship in 2011. Hmm. Julia V. Probably one of the main reasons why we broke up was because I felt like he put his insane pressure on me to keep to keep this insane secret. So she can, you know, for first it was the roommate Ross. Now, now it's your girl. <laughs> in the summer of 2012, Julia got an unexpected visit from Ross who told her he was moving to San Francisco. Julia V. He just showed up. I was honestly shocked to see him. Julia V also says Ross and I hung out by the water and then randomly he just said I'm not doing this site anymore. To me it seems strange like why would you bring it up? Uh, Julia V also added I didn't know if I fully believed him but I wanted to. So Julia V Viv Vivian's muse he said she said but Ross hadn't quit the site Silk Road was processing millions of dollars of transactions each month with Ross taking a cut of each one. Mila Patal Milan, Milan Patal adds, if you want to take away the technology, it's like other enterprise, organized crime, or otherwise. Vincent DeCostino, uh, Ross was the boss and below Ross was, like the uh, consigliere would be in a traditional organized crime family. Then he had his captains, right? His top moderators that would handle the business of the site day to day. And then below that, his soldiers, which were his lower level employees that didn't know too much, but were doing the mop up duty. In this world, Milan Patel adds, the person giving you direction to commit crimes, you don't know who he is. You don't know what he looks like. You don't know where he lives, but you trust him because you talk to him on the internet every day. Vincent DeCostino says Ross was the captain of the ship and said as much, you know, <laughs> this is what he said. He says, I make the rules. I'm the captain of this ship. And if you don't like the rules, get off the boat. Ross was a big dog. He was a big dog. He was a big dog. He was a big dog. <laughs> Ross, was pr Ross was proud of what he created and even did an interview with Forbes magazine, careful to hide his identity. Austin Mer Burgless, he said, he, he was touting that he was going to remain anonymous. He was so confident that he was never going to be found. Now, you see how criminals can be their own worst enemy? Vincent DeCostino says this, you know, he says they would literally have to come up behind you and watch you on your computer screen in order to catch you doing this. So this is where things start to go a little bit lower. He said, while Ross believed his identity was protected, the Silk Road site began to show vulnerabilities. Vincent DeCostino said the site began to get attacked. A lot of extortion started coming in, which is the blackmail, right? And, you know, I, I guess he was feeling himself. Ross was feeling himself. And in the spring of 2013, a vendor messaged Dread Pirate Roberts, threatening to expose the personal information of thousands of users. Vincent DeCostino added, he said this was a major problem because the whole basis of the site was the anonymity, anonymity, anonymity. <laughs> if the site gets hacked and it gets published, here's names and addresses for people selling and buying drugs. The site's done. So Ross decided to hire someone he believed was a member of a Hell's Angels biker gang to find and kill the blackmailer and his associates. He paid $650,000 from his Bitcoin account to get the job done. Now, Vincent DeCostino added, at this point, the, ide the idea of someone fixing this 
for what was for him a small amount of money was very appealing option rather than face the reality which was the site just might close up ross i mean they they, they got you you know what I'm saying? You can't, you know what I'm saying? So Vincent DeCostino says, now thankfully this was something that the FBI believed was a scam. But in his mind, it wasn't a scam. He actually paid for these murders. So Julia V comes in. She says, the murder for hires are still so hard for me to believe. Like that side of Ross, I've never saw. I think in his chase for success, he was willing to do anything for it. And a lot of people on this site convinced him to do things I don't think he otherwise would have done. So, Ross, it seems to me that Julia saying you kind of was a little bit of a follower. Jared comes and says he became dangerous to the point that he was going to protect it at any cost. Austin Burglars uh, comes in and he says, I never had a doubt that the team was going to be successful and ultimately find DPR. I knew that even the most confident of criminals made errors. So here is a break in the case, right? Vincent DeCostino, remember, he's the former special agent of the FBI uh, NY cyber branch. There were a lot of mistakes that could be made in setting up a site like this that someone who wasn't very street smart could easily make. Milan Patal says you will eventually make a mistake because you feel invincible which is true and you see this a lot in uh crime movies the criminal is getting away with it they get sloppy they get you know what i'm saying arrogant and then they get caught in the early summer of 2013 after nearly a year of trying to crack the inner workings of the silk road website agents in the fbi's new york cyber branch finally got a break they noticed a coding error on the site now in my opinion it was been going down because the roommate ratted them out and julia was like <laughs> I don't want to be with you no more. So Jared <laughs> said they were able to actually find vulnerabilities in the website where they saw it actually leaking its IP address. So <laughs> Ross was somewhere in his in his room typing and doing things and he doesn't know there's a major code error. Uh, it would be a game changer. Investigators discovered the location of the server hosting the website 2,700 miles away in Iceland. So Austin Burglars uh, comes in he says it's pretty monumental we had been working on this diligently for months and to get a win like this was just huge agents flew to iceland but didn't take the actual server not wanting to raise the suspicions of dread pirate roberts instead they made a mirror image copy uh they could work from austin burglars one, you know he says once we got the server now we could really dig in and do the investigative type of work that the fbi is known to do the biggest thing that we got was just an understanding of the volume of activity that was happening on the silk road it was just immense agents learned that in just two and a half years around 1.2 million transactions had been processed on this silk road site with bitcoin generating the equivalent of approximately one count them one billion in revenue the agents also found information and communications dread pirates roberts believe would never be discovered so now milan patal comes in she says it gave us insight as to how many people were on the site what kinds of private messages were being shared vincent DeCostino says everything was out in the open it was almost like someone saying the odds of anyone getting in here are low but if they get in here i am done Agents could see could even see records of some of Dread Pirate Roberts' own activities. So everything is, you know, this was again like this a big break. Austin Burglars says who's logging in and who's logging out, who's using the administrative console, meaning who is actually operating the site. That led them to an internet cafe in San Francisco. So man, they were all over the world about this guy. Jared, the person that was signing in, the name was Frosty. By now, Homeland Security agent Jared uh, had made 3,600 drug seizures. He even went on the site and made more than 50 undercover purchases. But his biggest get came in the spring of 2013 when he located one of Dread Pirate Roberts' deputies who created the screen name Cirrus. So Jared adds, he says, we got a Silk Road administrator to cooperate with us. Vincent DeCostino, if a person cooperates, the law enforcement agent can take over that account. You're able to assume the identity of that person, okay? Austin Burglars also added, he said, it's no different from being an undercover in the kind of uh, the Donnie Brasco sense of the word, where you're at the table with mob bosses. 
So Jared says impersonating Cirrus was able to gain the trust of other admins and eventually the Silk Road boss, Dread Pirate Roberts. Jared says he, uh, he was running a pretty tight ship. Uh, he gave me assignments right away and you really wanted to excel and do well so that he would give you more assignments. So he, he did have a uh, structure and organization uh, at the top, right? So Vincent DeCostino said Jared became a very trusted employee during his undercover work, learning the inner workings of how the site operated, which was very, very valuable. Also working the case was the DEA and the Internal Revenue Service. So, oh my gosh, Ross, you had the IRS on your case too? Man, yeah, you really was on in some deep stuff. So Gary Alfort, right? He, he was he, he, Gary Alfort says, "My name is Gary Alfort, and I'm I was a special agent in the New York field office." Uh, Gary Alfort was a supervisory special agent in the IRS. Uh, while they're investigating public corruption and drug trafficking, we'll be tracking the money that's financing these illegal activities. Like all of the investigators, Alford was determined to find the person behind Dread Pirate Roberts, so he used Google's advanced search option for the earliest mentions of Silk Road. It seems like the IRS is in everybody's pockets. Is the IRS behind me? <laughs> so Jared says he was looking to see did anyone really mention Silk Road prior to us knowing that it had existed. So Gary says Alfred and I came across postings by a user named Altoid. One uh, was on a website that discussed magic mushrooms and other psychedelic type drugs. Then another mention of Altoid, uh, Gary Alfred who adds and also one of the Bitcoin talk forum. And what it appeared the user was doing was advertising the site. Digging deeper, the IRS sleuth found another clue. And here's where Gary Alford adds. He says, on the Bitcoin talk forum, it had multiple postings. And in the final posting, the individual listed an email account. Ross Albright at gmail.com. It was the first time Ross Albright's name had come up in the case. Alfred shared his findings with his colleagues. So Gary Alfred says that they thought it was interesting, but it didn't appear they felt it was compelling or enough to take significant action against Mr. Albright. But I never put it to the side. In every free moment after hours on the weekends, I would try to get information about Silk Road. So he found a second mention of Albright's name in a post about coding for the dark web with a new identity. Austin Burglis on that blog says on that blog post, he quickly changed his username to Frosty. So he think he in New York. He think he knows he changed it to Frosty. Gary Alfred added. So I wrote down Frosty in every spare moment. Alfred kept searching Ross Albright name. Albright's name uh, that led to a 2012 post from Story Corps, which was a national project to record personal stories. It was a conversation between Ross Albright and a friend. So we have a new character, Renee Pinnell. She says, so Ross, uh, how did you come to live in San Francisco? Ross Albright uh, said, you twisted my arm until I said, ah, fine, I'll come. Uh, Gary Alfred said that uh, I learned that Mr. Albright moved from Austin, Texas to San Francisco. So Ross, you, you on the move, you on the run, huh? So Renee says, you think you're going to live forever. And Ross Albright says, I think it's a possibility. Gary uh, Alfred says that posting from Frosty and that interview convinced me in the heart that this is Dread Pirates Roberts. So here's the closing in, right? San Francisco on July 2013, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers who were not involved in the Silk Road investigation intercepted nine fake IDs coming in, into the U.S. from Canada. So Ross Albright had fake IDs. These, you know, th th he had nine fake IDs belonging uh, that belonged to uh, Ross Albright, who said uh, Jared. And now we have the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. So agents were dispatched to the intended recipient's residence to investigate. And Vincent DeCostino comes in and says, And out comes this man who was pictured in the identification. They can see it's the same person. They ask, what's his name? And he says, my name is Ross Albright. And they say, okay, well, Ross, you had these IDs mailed to you and you're in the picture. You're the man in the photograph. Uh, Jared says Ross was nervous at first and says, you know, I don't know anything about them. Too late, Ross. Come on, C R Ross. Stop it. Stop it. Vincent DeCostino says, 
And as the agents continued their conversations with him, his response was, well, I heard of this website called Silk Road where you can buy and sell anything, including fake IDs. So, how, how, Ross, how are you going to act like you don't know the own website? I thought you was big dog. I thought you was big dog. You come work for me. I'm the captain of the ship. What happened to that? So, Jared says the agent didn't know anything about Silk Road at the time, but he did a good report and documented it. Soon after the, vis um, the visit about the fake IDs, Ross Albright abruptly moved. So we have Al Alex uh, Barher. Uh, Peter, put that on the screen. My name is Alex um, Barher, and I was Ross's roommate in San Francisco. Oh, you're the snitch. <laughs> he was Ross's roommate in San Francisco. My housemates and I were looking for another uh, roommate, and so we put an ad on Craigslist, and Ross said he did stuff with uh, computers, and he was, sort of a, uh, he was sort of vague about exactly what he did. So, okay, so this is a different roommate, not the snitch. Ross brought very few possessions with him. So, Alex Barr says Ross came with some clothing and, like his computer, of course, Ross was definitely on his computer a lot. By now, law enforcement agencies investigating Silk Road had several pieces of the puzzle. The FBI had found the server. The IRS had identified Ross Albright's name in a personal email address and Homeland Security had an undercover agent in direct contact with Dread Pirate Roberts, but no one was seeing the whole picture yet. It was uh, around the time Ross and his ex, Julia, started talking again. So Julia V, right? She comes back. She says, he basically just invited me to San Francisco. I had never been before so i said why not but then he told me i had to buy my own ticket that's why you messed up ross i was like oh well i guess if he quit the site then he doesn't have money so maybe you have a ride <laughs> ross so julia v says i was just like really into ross that weekend everything was very similar to how we were in college but something seemed strange to julia right she said something seems strange julia v said he didn't let me see him on the computer at all that's when I knew something was up. He specifically was not on the computer except when I would leave to go maybe, you know, take a shower. And then I popped in the room and he closed his computer. So Julie says, you, you know, the way he told me his computer was set up was that if he closed it, all the information would be destroyed if anyone ever tried to get it. Uh, despite her suspicion that Ross was still involved in Silk Road, Julia was interested in rekindling the relationship she invited ross to visit her back in austin so julia v right she says i was begging him to hurry up and come to me because i had very li uh, had a very bad feeling i kept telling him i said push your trip up leave your computer at home just come to austin and he just he was like no i've got to do some more things here and i'll see you in a few weeks I got my ticket. So in August of 2013, Jared uh, joined forces with the FBI of the, the New York Cyber Team. Uh, they showed him the mirror copy of the Silk Road server. When he saw a reference to San Francisco, things started to click. So Jared comes and he says, every time that I would actually chat with Dread Pirate Roberts, something would happen to his account where I would see that his time zone was Pacific time zone. More puzzle pieces fell into place when IRS Special Agent Gary Alford met uh, with uh, Jared and the FBI New York Cyber Team. On the wall of their office, Alford saw a board covered with leads. Gary Alford, he says, so I tried not to look at the board because this is their house, this is their office, and this is their investigation. But I couldn't help to see the arrows are pointing to one thing on the board that said San Francisco. So Alfred knew from the Story Corps piece that Ross Albright lived in San Francisco. Gary Alfred says, he said, and I say, hey, I have a guy I'm looking at who lives in San Francisco. Uh, more puzzle pieces fell into place when the IRS special agent Gary Alfred met with Homeland Security uh, Jared at the FBI New York cyber team. After leaving that meeting, Alfred ran another search on Ross Albright and found the newly filed Homeland Security report about those nine fake IDs. So we have Garrett Alfred who says, uh, and I almost hit the roof. I was like, this is him, this is him. I went running into my supervisor's office. Immediately, we got on the phone with the assistant United States attorney. The prosecutor gets us all on the phone, the FBI, HSI, and myself. In any investigation, there's a watershed moment. And in the Silk Road case, it came when Alfred mentioned the, world, the word Frosty. Uh, one of the FBI cyber team agents was floored. 
uh, Gary Alfred said, he's like, are you sure Frosty Frosty? And I was like, yes, Frosty. And then he said, well, that is the username and the name of the server, Frosty at Frosty. And then there was a quiet uh, on the phone. And so everyone kind of took in that, oh, this might be it. So Jared comes in, he says, this was a big break for us. That was the moment where we said, okay, there is something more to this. So Jared says they felt they had their man, but one more clue convinced them. Jared said there was one big thing for me. It had to do with the writing. So almost every single time I chat with him as Cirrus, he would say the word yeah at least once during the chat. And it was spelled Y-E-A, capital, right? Then I found Ross Albright's YouTube page. Oh yeah, Ross. And so that was the name of the YouTube page. And it was spelled Y-E-A. Austin Burglars comes in and says, uh, investigative wheels start spinning. And one of the things that's done is a subpoena to Gmail. With access to Albright's Google history, FBI agents discovered that his Gmail and Silk Road account activity did line up. So every single, Jared says, every single time Dread Pirates Roberts would sign into, uh, onto the forums or sign onto the marketplace, you'd also see Ross Albright sign onto his Google account or sign off his Google, Google account. And that gave us a lot of confidence after a few days of uh, it being very consistent that this was our guy. In the span of just 10 days, the U.S. Attorney's Office drafted a criminal complaint. The FBI got an arrest warrant and the team headed to San Francisco to take Ross Ubrick, but to make their case, they needed to catch him with his fingers literally on the keyboard. So Austin Burglars comes in, he says, so the, so the plan was to make sure to arrest Ross uh, with the laptop open and unlocked, much harder to much harder than it sounds right and here's the end of the road in october 2013 members of the fbi cybersecurity team traveled to san francisco to arrest the man they believe was the mastermind behind silk road ross albright so austin burglar says we don't we didn't want to do a traditional fbi knock on the door go in and arrest him in his living room because we knew that we wouldn't have access to the laptop we needed to make something happen so Jared uh, logs in undercover as serious he was still in contact with albright's alias dread pirate roberts so Jared says, I'm digitally watching Dread Pirate Roberts online and then physical eyes on Ross Albright had him still at his house in San Francisco. Uh, so Jared went into a local cafe and ordered a coffee. Meanwhile, the surveillance team saw Ross leave his house. So Jared says, so I was waiting for my coffee. The FBI agent walks in and says, our friend is coming down the street. I walked outside and turned to my right. And there's Ross Albright actually standing next to me about 10 to 15 feet away at a street corner, waiting for the light to change. Ross walked in the same cafe Jared had just left. So Jared says, I think he's uh, gonna, you know, probably walk right because there wasn't any open seats when I went in there. And sure enough, he turns right around and then goes right next door into the Glen Park Library. Undercover FBI agents quickly took their places inside the library. So here's Vincent DeCostino. Ross Albright heads upstairs and is observed entering the science fiction section where he sits down at a table there. And this point, Dread Pirate Roberts is not online. Jared comes in and says, we're sitting on a park bench across the street from the Glen Park Library, and I have my computer, and we're just waiting, hopefully, for Dread Pirates Roberts to sign online. Austin Burglars comes in and says, he sat at a table, opened up his laptop. Jared comes in and says, we saw within a few minutes Dread Pirates Roberts ping on my computer. He does sign on the, the um, staff chat, and so that... My, that's my cue pretty much to start up the chat. Uh, Vincent DeCostino says the agents in the library can see Ross typing a couple of hundred feet just outside the library. Unbeknownst to Ross Albright is, is the person he's speaking to. Jared directs him to go look at this message, knowing that he has to log in in order to actually access it. Once I, Ross Albright, gets uh, to the post, at the moment, the order to execute the arrest is given. So uh, Jared says, so he turns over his shoulder to see an actual fight occur. As he does that, another surveillance agent walks up, picks up the laptop, walks it over to our computer, tech hands it to him. And as that happens, Ross Alb Albright lunges towards the laptop and another, and another agent walks up behind him, uh, bear hugs him. So Austin Burglars comes in and says, and then the investigative team then placed Ross under arrest. 
So uh, Vincent DaCosta Nino says, so the concern at the point at that point is, you know, we have uh, to keep the laptop alive. Austin Burglar says, and don't let it go to sleep. Don't let it encrypt. Don't let it close. Uh, the cyber team made sure the laptop stayed open. They found a treasure trove of evidence, which was fake IDs, chats, even Ross's personal journal. Most damning, the computer's username was Frosty. Vincent DeCostino says, I've never seen more incriminating information in one spot ever in the 11 years I was with the FBI. Ross Albright was charged with seven counts, including narcotics trafficking, computer hacking, money laundering, and a kingpin statute uh, usually reserved for mafia dons and cartel leaders. Uh, Vincent DeCostino says, when, you, when uh, you're looking at a site doing the volume that Silk Road was doing, nothing else would really fit charge-wise other than charge him as a kingpin. So Julia V comes in and says, my good friend called me and she didn't even want to tell me herself. She said, Google Ross Albright. And then I did and obviously found Ross Albright arrested. All the whole thing and then I just started uh, bawling and falling on the ground like I was so upset. Julia says authorities spoke with her after Ross's arrest. Julia V says, I mean, I was just like I knew he was doing something shady, but I had no idea how big it was. In January 2015, four years after Silk Road started, Ross Albright trial began. The defense admitted while he had created Silk Road, he handed it off to others uh, who then lured him back into uh, take the fall. After a 12-day trial and less than four hours of deliberations, a jury found Ross Albright guilty on all counts. So Jared comes in and says there's a lot of attempts to try and throw an alternate per uh, throw in alternate perpetrators and other things that would try to make it seem like there are some injustice done. But the evidence was overwhelming. The jury found it overwhelming. At his sentencing, family members of individuals who died while using drugs purchased on Silk Road delivered victim uh, impact statements. So Jared says, so the mother, you know, gets up and talks about her son, Preston, who took drugs uh, uh, from so, um, Silk Road and fell off a balcony. Ouch. And, and she talked about the last day she held him. And so uh, there was a photo that she provided to the court about, you know, the last day she saw him and the last day she was with him. So Jared says pretty much like the whole courtroom's in tears and, you know, hearing this. And it's something that as a parent, you know, that for me, it was enormously impactful. And so then it came down to the point that Ross had a chance to then address the court. So Vincent DeCostino says, you know, as far as the half-hearted apology that he presented and, you know, the kind of general never meant uh, it to go out this direction, it was sort of expected understanding that this person was clearly thinking about his appeal at that point. Uh, so Jared says the judge, the the judge took a little bit extended break and comes back. She's like, you had all these things going for you, but you're no different than any other criminal on the street. So Vincent DeCostino says, ultimately, he received two life sentences plus 40 years and the federal system does not allow parole. So Julia V comes in and says, I don't think he deserves to be in jail for the rest of his life. You know, I mean, maybe take the best years of his life, but leave him with the last part of his life. So uh, Vincent DeCostino says, here is, here is a person that, by all accounts, had every opportunity to do something great. Ross was someone that myself or anyone on our squad could have easily been friends with in a parallel universe. Uh, at one point, Ross Albright was a multimillionaire. The government was able to recover about $70 million. Silk Road was a lucrative and dangerous venture until the FBI cyber team shut it down. Austin Burglar says if it wasn't for the FBI's technical capability, we would still be investigating Silk Road. Uh, Vincent DeCostino says there's something, as you know, an alumni of the FBI New York office I am really, really proud of. So that was the story of, of, of it, it captivated me. Uh, what do you think about the story? Please let me know in the comment section below. Please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the notification bell. I appreciate your viewership. See you on the next video.